thank you very much uh, for the warm welcome. It's my first time to be in Singapore, and I've uh, been overwhelmed with the hospitality uh, that my wife and I have enjoyed here so far. We're looking forward to the rest of our week here before we return to Houston uh, on Monday. Uh, I can't uh, echo any uh, stronger uh, what Padushia talked about with the opportunities available uh, space-related. I will also add that uh, I've been in many work environments in my lifetime and in my career. Over the years, I spent uh, my whole career in the, in the U.S. Army, in the military. Had some great work environments in the military, but nothing has surpassed the, the work environment um, that I've enjoyed in human spaceflight and the space program in general. And it's not uh, so much because of, of what you might think, going to space and all the exciting things that entails uh, or is involved in that, but it's the people. It's the people that we have the opportunity to work with. Um, and you probably get a taste of that here in an environment like this. Uh, the, the people that work on the International Space Station program, for example, and the space shuttle program before that, and really the international partnership that we pull together are all there because they believe in the mission. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a, a real team environment. There's not competition among folks. We're all there because we believe in what we do and we enjoy doing it. And it just makes for a great environment. This is what, this is a view. We can turn those lights off again if you would. Um, this is the view that inspires all of us, right? This is just, this is a representative view of the vantage point that space offers all of us. And of course, this is looking back at the Earth, and that became personally my favorite um, thing to do in my free time, was to look out the window and study the Earth. And in a coming video here, I'm going to show you some examples of what you can see there. And of course, the, the, we can enjoy the, the view, but there's also lots of potential applications of uh, bringing technology that maybe you're working on to space, uh, back to Earth, and of course out into deep space as well as we explore beyond Earth orbit. But this is the view that inspires us all. The next slide, and the mind the convincing slide that this The next slide is the vantage point of the International Space Station, which you've heard a, a lot about. Who here has seen the space station fly over? Anybody? Quite a few of you, okay. Those of you that haven't, maybe you're not aware that you can see it with the naked eye uh, fly over. You can go out and get an app or go to a website uh, and uh, find when it'll look ahead in the next few weeks maybe and see if there are opportunities for you to see it fly over. If you haven't done it, I encourage you to do so. Go find out when uh, when it's coming over Singapore uh, and it'll be after sunset or before sunrise uh, when the sun is still shining on the space station as it flies over. And it's pretty amazing, especially when you start learning more and more about the program and learn about the people that are currently on board and watch this thing fly over. Sometimes you can see it for up to four minutes. Of course, you need a few less clouds than what we typically see here uh, in Singapore, but, uh, uh, but nonetheless, you can see it fly over. This space station, we began to build in 1998. That's when the first element was launched. We finished it in 2011. There was a little bit of an interruption there with the, the Columbia accident when we uh, lost that crew. Uh, and the space shuttle was grounded for almost three years, but then we picked back up again and finished it 1998 to 2011. So it was a great investment of time to get this thing built. Uh, there were about 40, uh, 37 exactly, to space shuttle uh, missions dedicated to the International Space Station, and about 40 or so roughly uh, Russian rocket launches also dedicated to the building of it. Started in 1998, we launched the first permanent crew, or first expedition to the space station in the fall of 2000. And a lot of people don't realize that since then, since the fall of the year 2000, we've had continuous human presence in space. Because on the space station, we hand over each crew. Uh, a standard uh, mission length up there is uh, six months. Currently. We have a crew of six. We started out as a crew of three. Uh, when the shuttle was grounded, we were a crew of two, uh, just to maintain presence on the space station to keep it operational. Then we picked up and went back to a crew of three, and eventually in 2009 got to a crew of six, which is the standard crew size. We rotate half the crew at a time. 
So we launch, and we're rotating on Russian Soyuz launches. We launch uh, four Soyuzes a year. Uh, you may not, uh, you may have missed it on the news, but we just launched the, the latest Soyuz this last Friday to send three people up there to the space station to round out the current uh, crew of, of six. To give you an idea of the size of this thing, if you could lay it on the ground, it's bigger than a football field. If you could weigh it, it would weigh almost a million pounds. Uh, the inside the habitable volume where the crew lives and work, the volume there is equivalent of uh, a 5,000 square foot house. I'm sorry, I don't have a square meter equivalent, but that's a big house, that's a mansion. That's the volume inside the, uh, the space station. Uh, so people ask me all the time, do you get claustrophobic there? And the answer is no, because we're usually spread out uh, on that big volume of the space station, different parts of the space station uh, doing our work. Uh, but it's an incredible facility. It also, as was uh, alluded to, it has opened the doors to lots of opportunities, and those opportunities are only going to increase in scope. NASA has been very proactive over the last couple of years to try to open the doors in a broader way uh, to get commercial space on board, and that includes a lot of student experiments, uh, experiments of that magnitude, of the, of the magnitude of a CubeSat. Um, and, and NASA is continuing to look for ways to open the doors to get more people involved in space. So I, I can't emphasize or reiterate enough that the opportunities are there uh, and they're only going to grow in the future. So if you have that interest, I uh, encourage you to uh, research those opportunities and then uh, pursue them. What I'd like to do next is show you uh, about a 15 or 16 minute video that kind of gives you a little bit of a feel for the rhythm of life on board the space station. I, I mentioned that we rotate three people four times a year, maintaining the standard crew size of six. This video is going to cover uh, the flight I participated on last year. We launched in March of 2016 and landed in September of 16. Uh, and it'll give you a, a sense of the uh, of the, of the rhythm as, as well as the content of a, a typical mission. Whoops, before I do that, I, I think I have another little video here. Let's see if it works. <coughs> I mentioned the space shuttle. How many here, has anybody here seen a space shuttle launch? Anybody get to the cake? I know the opportunities were limited. And the, yeah, you've seen it. Uh, it's, uh, it was incredible. And we're all very sad that they're all now in museums on display. Uh, you get to the States and you have an opportunity to go see one of these. I, I encourage you to do that. When it was on the launch pad, it weighed 4 million pounds. 4 million pound rocket to get about uh, 40,000 pounds of cargo and the crew of seven uh, up into orbit. Uh, it, Hopefully the video works here. Let me try it dancing again. Next one, there's a little video clip here. This thing weighed 4 million pounds on the launch pad. It produced 7.5 million pounds of thrust on the launch pad to uh, get that 4 million pounds into orbit. You guys ever have a technical problem? <laughs> <laughs> I have it on my Mac if you need And what you can do is. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. It crashed. It crashed? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can get my laptop. What you can do is instead of going into PowerPoint, you can just launch the video yeah. by itself. And not, not the short video, but the. There's one that says E4748. And this is the first time I've ever had a technical issue. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we work with a lot of things similar to what you work on on board the space station. A lot of folks don't realize, of course, we have the space station that is computer systems. 
and it's a distributed uh, computer architecture that was designed in the 80s, so it's old technology, very old technology, but we also have gotten a, a mouse land on board uh, with distributed laptops, and we're developing new applications all the time that don't directly run the space station, but they support all the operations on board the space station. And it's got audio if you have audio. The, the space shuttle, I, I threw this in there just to give you a, an example of the magnitude of the power uh, that was present with the space shuttle launch. If you ever had the opportunity to go watch a launch, it would be three miles away. What's that? Almost five kilometers. It would shine five kilometers away. And it would shake your whole body. There's so much power uh, coming out of it. Uh, uh, shuttle launch like a Soyuz launch. Uh, the ascent takes less than nine minutes to get to orbit. And then after that nine minutes, you're going 17,500 miles an hour or about 25,000 uh, kilometers per hour. That's orbital velocity. That's basic physics. You have to go that fast to get to orbit and stay in orbit and not re-enter the atmosphere. Um, going that orbital velocity, um, on the space shuttle and the space station and the Russian Soyuz, we orbit the Earth every 90 minutes. Um, so 16 times a day we go around the world. Uh, by the way, the inclination of the space station is at 51.6 degrees. That's the inclination from the equator. What that means is when we orbit the Earth, we cross the equator, go up to 51.6 uh, degrees north latitude, come back across the equator again, 51.6 degrees south latitude. Uh, and every orbit takes 90 minutes, so when you cross the equator again, set, going from south to north, you're about 1,500 miles uh, to the, uh, to the uh, west of where you were in the previous orbit. So it's a great platform to study the Earth. And over a period of time, days and weeks, you see, of course, every day the, the entire globe. But over weeks and months, you see every point on the globe except for the poles in different lighting conditions. Day, night, different sun angles. And, of course, after weeks and months, the lot seasons go by also. And so it's, it's a very unique vantage point uh, st to study the Earth. We're going to the backup computer. We have redundant systems on everything. And uh, I could talk all night about failures of systems where you go to the back to go to the back We're going to the backup tonight. Here we go. So you can imagine riding on the top of this thing and having those solid rocket boosters light off and now you're being pushed off the launch pad directly uh, at, uh, with seven and a half million pounds behind you. Lots of, uh, lots of power there. And uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, you're in orbit in less than nine minutes. So a lot of power. And by the time we got to orbit on the shuttle, what was left was about uh, 250, the, um, thousand pounds of mass. So most of it is fuel in the fuel tanks, uh, which are expended in the first nine minutes. So it's the so Believe me, these guys are under a lot more pressure than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, come out of power There's a file that's got 47, 48 in it. It's a video file. <laughs> just go ahead and play that. Right so so Screen. Okay, okay, that's a screen by the door, right? Nope. Now that's the other. 
Okay, now, yeah, just advance one more time, and then we're in the chance. Here we go. <laughs> This one's one of those sports channels where you see replay over and over. And over. <laughs> okay, here we go. This is the video I was talking about earlier, I mentioned earlier, that will highlight in, uh, the mission of an expedition crew. We launched from Baikonur, Kazakhstan, which is the same place that Yuri Gagarin launched from over 50 years ago, uh, the first man in space. The rocket rolls out two days before launch, and then uh, on launch day, uh, the three of us get into spacesuits, uh, go out and do the final report to the commission, say we're ready to go, they say the rocket's ready, and then we take the bus ride out to the launch pad, um, and they, the Russians out there, we have a traditional wave at the base of the, the rocket, and then three of us, plus a technician, get in a two-man elevator to take the ride to the top of the rocket. <laughs> Uh, you got that one. Good. You're awake. Uh, about two and a half hours before launch, we're getting into the capsule, which of course is at the very top end of the rocket. Three of us climb in there one at a time uh, and strap in. It's uh, You're in the fetal position, so your knees are up at your chest. I call it as if we're triplets in the womb. <laughs> very tight spot. Uh, go through the countdown at a very precise moment, we lift off, and that's the moment required for that day to launch and then later rendezvous with the International Space Station. So we have to be in the plane of the orbit as the Earth rotates. The launch pad is, is moving. When it moves through the plane, we lift off, uh, get to orbit in nine minutes, and uh, less than six hours later, in this case, we were rendezvousing with the space station. This is what it looked like as we approached it. Uh, this next scene is what we look like from the space station as we approach the space station. We flew around and aligned ourselves with the docking port that we were to dock with, and here's the moment of, of docking uh, our Soyuz to the International Space Station. Within a couple of hours, we did the leak checks, got the hatches open, and we came inside the space station and joined the crew of three that were awaiting our arrival, and our arrival rounded out what we called Expedition 47 which was made up of two Americans, uh, three Russians, uh, and a British astronaut. Tim Peake was the first uh, British astronaut, first and only to, be, uh, to fly uh, into space and in the International Space Station. This is what the, the modules look like inside. Uh, we're right in the middle of the space station here in the place we call Node 1, or the Unity module, which is the place we typically have our meals. Uh, every day. You can see how roomy it is. You can see how cluttered it is with all of the, the different experiments and stuff that are up there and the equipment. You can also see how easy it is to move around in weightlessness. We had a very busy first three weeks or so after we arrived. We had three different cargo ships arrive. This first one was a Russian built progress cargo ship that launched uh, from the same place that we had launched from a week previous. Uh, and then we had a Cygnus uh, a cargo ship arrive a week later. And then finally a third one was a SpaceX uh, cargo ship. This is the Cygnus, um, orbital science of Cygnus, and here we have the SpaceX Dragon arrive. All of them bringing cargo, equipment, spare parts, um, food, uh, clothing, and science experiments. The uh, SpaceX Dragon here also brought a unique uh, piece of cargo. It's called the B module, or the Bigelow uh, Experimental or, uh, Activity Module. It's an inflatable module, and it's a great example of what I believe is uh, one of the space station's primary purpose, that is to uh, test out uh, the development of new technology. So inflatable module technology is relatively new. It has a great promise for applications in the future. We had plucked it out with a robotic arm from the Dragon SpaceX and attached it to the space station and then slowly inflated. This is very sped up. Um, it took a lot longer than this to, in, to inflate it. Uh, but in the end, it was very successful. It continues to fly on board the space station 
with a plan to have it on board at least for the next several years uh, to test out its technology, the durability uh, to last in space. I think it has a great promise for the future, both in, in um, free uh, space flying vehicles as well as surface applications, say, on the moon or Mars. Here's a moment where the crew celebrated that significant milestone. Uh, now we get to the uh, end of Expedition 47. Now we're in June of last year. It was time for those th three crewmates that had been on board when we arrived uh, to depart and return to the planet after their approximate six month stay. So here we have a, a change of command where American astronaut Tim Cooper handed over command to me and that was a transition from Expedition 47 to 48. Uh, we said uh, goodbye to Tim, Tim, and Yuri here in this case, and they went out the door into their Soyuz, closed the hatch, uh, they undocked and uh, returned uh, safely to Earth. That left three of us on board, three to spread out into this massive <laughs> facility of uh, the space station, uh, where you always have a lot of fun up there. We all turn into kids again. Um, it's a great playground up there to be in a weightless environment. We stayed very busy during that three weeks uh, doing different experiments to include uh, an experimental docking of, uh, of a progress ship here is which, what uh, Alexei and Oleg were conducting there. I continued experiments as well as uh, maintenance and, uh, and other operations on the space station uh, for that three weeks while we waited for the arrival of three new crew members to round out Expedition 48. So here we are back in the launch pad, that same launch pad we had launched from just a few months earlier with another crew of three uh, getting ready to launch. In this case, they uh, launched on a, a, a Soyuz rocket that was a new model, an upgrade. Uh, so instead of docking within six hours, they docked about two days after uh, launch while they tested out that Soyuz. Uh, but we welcomed them on board, American Kate Rubens, it was her first flight, uh, Takuya Onishi. Uh, was the first flight of uh, the second crew member that comes in here. He's from Japan. And uh, Anatoly Ovenation was, is, was his second flight, a uh, Russian cosmonaut. I had a great time up there with uh, Takuya and Kate, especially uh, uh, being the experienced guy, uh, bringing somebody for the first time through all the experiences in space was a great reward for me personally. We do a lot of science and experiments, obviously, up here. Here's uh, some scenes of an example of one of them uh, developed up at MIT. It's called the SPHERES uh, experiment, and it's the development of uh, flight control systems for satellites. So we would program these things to fly around in different formations, or maybe one would do some maneuvers and the other one would, uh, would follow the first one and do the maneuvers. We're also doing quite a few student activities with that SPHERES experiment. Here's another very interesting experiment, one of the more interesting ones I found last year. These are human heart cells. Human heart cells, and I never knew it, but the cells communicate with one another and beat in unison. So our hearts beat at the cellular level. I always thought it was the muscle fiber level. Uh, we do a lot of experiments studying the human body, and here's an example of Alexei and I in an experiment called Fluid Shifts, trying to better understand the impacts on the human body in the weightless environment of, of space on the space station. So that's a, a great deal of what we do. Uh, we talked about these CubeSats and, and uh, other experiments like this. There's, there's a category of experiments we actually deploy outside and then deploy away from the space station. And what you see, he, see here is a series of uh, views of putting uh, experimental uh, cluster outside, grabbing it with a robotic arm, and then deploying it there. I loved it being an old army guy. It's like firing artillery uh, away from the space station. These are very small um, uh, deployables, about this long and, and maybe that wide. Um, so we sent them off. I never knew what they were going to do. They were all different inside. I never knew what was inside the box, but our job was just to uh, get them deployed. Now we get into uh, July of uh, a year ago, and it's time for another SpaceX cargo ship to arrive. Uh, so here we are in what we call the cupola, and I'll show you some other scenes from the cupola here in a few minutes, um, uh, to grab the, the Dragon capsule, the SpaceX capsule, get it attached. And then this one had a very unique cargo on board. It was the International Docking Adapter, which was attached to the very front end of the space station by doing the spacewalk. So its arrival meant that Kate 
and I were going to go outside. We ended up doing two spacewalks. Each of them were about six and a half or seven hours long. It's the most uh, challenging thing we do physically and mentally uh, to spend all day outside in the pressure suit uh, doing the work. Uh, in this case, in part to, uh, to connect that international docking adapter. That docking adapter will be required for the future commercial crew vehicles that are currently in development to be able to dock uh, to the International Space Station. This is not only the most physically and mentally challenging thing we do, it's the most rewarding thing. That's true with life, right? The hardest things we do usually bring the biggest rewards. But to go outside and to, uh, to basically climb on the outside of the space station and be able to view the thing on the outside as well as the entire globe of the planet of the Earth um, is, is a pretty amazing experience. Uh, you, it's a very busy time out there. Everything is tightly choreographed. There's a lot of work to do. It's hard, but every once in a while we get a moment where we take a break uh, and we can take in the environment that's uh, around us. So it's definitely a highlight. After the two spacewalks, there's a moment celebrating that milestone uh, with the entire crew. Uh, now, I mentioned the cupola a couple minutes ago. I call it the window on the world. It was added in 2010. And it's the one place on the space station. It's got these six radio windows and then the center window. It's the one place on the space station where you can see the entire globe of the Earth from uh, one vantage point. So it quickly becomes everybody's favorite place to be in your free time, uh, to view the Earth and, and watch as the continents go by and all the details of, of the surface of the Earth uh, and the weather patterns and the geology and the geography and the ocean um, and, and all the other phenomena uh, like these uh, glaciers here or this uh, uh, plankton bloom off uh, the coast of South America or this horizon view of uh, just a big weather systems. Uh, here's the uh, western part of America in Central Valley is, uh, is right there in California. Uh, in the Sierra Mountains. Here's a, a composite of a coral reef in the Bahamas. Beautiful coral reefs uh, in the Bahamas. The most beautiful in the world in, in my opinion. The, these are uh, ice flows off the coast of Canada early in the spring of 2016. Irrigation circles uh, in a riverbed in the dry, arid land of New Mexico. Here we're in the southern tip of South America in the Patagonia region and the glaciers down there uh, that come off a beautiful ice shelf there in Patagonia and Chile. Uh, th these are uh, uh, salt gnomes in the Great Salt Desert of the country of Iran, a very unique uh, geological formation. Uh, and here's looking on the horizon right after a sunset. Uh, where you can see the layers of the atmosphere, the high cloud formations silhouetted, which are the black here, uh, uh, and the, the layers of the atmosphere from orange and, and green. Uh, here's the, uh, the Alps in Central Europe. They're looking straight down in the Grand Canyon in the Colorado River bed here uh, through an 800 millimeter lens. This is Teton National Park in Wyoming in the States. This is an amazing view of what we call noctilucent clouds, occasionally seen over the poles, either north or south pole. Very mysterious and, they're, and very unusual in terms of, of uh, formations. We think they're ice crystals. That's the, uh, just a few examples of what you can get from the vantage point of looking back at the Earth, uh, especially through a big lens. And all that, all that photography was taken with handheld photography with different lens sizes. Now we get into September of last year, it's uh, in the rhythm of life. Now it's our top turn to uh, prepare to return to Earth. So we had another change of command, which marked the end of Expedition 48 and the beginning of Expedition 49. And Alexei, uh, Oleg and I got back into the Soyuz capsule that we had arrived on six months earlier, got in back in those spacesuits, uh, launch and entry suits for the Soyuz, and then prepared for undocking. From undocking to touchdown on the Earth usually takes about three hours and 15 or 20 minutes. So it all happens fairly quickly. We undock from the space station, fire the engines to separate to get a safe distance away from the space station. And then at just the precise time flying backwards, we fire the main engine of the Soyuz a little over four minutes to slow us down a very precise amount so that then we will free fall into the atmosphere. We fire that engine incidentally off the southern tip of South America to land in Kazakhstan. 
And this is the time during the re-entry of the atmosphere uh, where we're literally coming back in the atmosphere in a fireball, obviously because of the, uh, the friction and the heat uh, uh, built up by the speed uh, that uh, we're coming down. Then the parachute opens. We drift down for about 12 minutes or so, land in central Kazakhstan. In our case, the search and rescue forces uh, spotted us as soon as the parachute opened, followed us on down, and they were there within a minute or two of our touchdown uh, to get us out of the capsule. Um, we, we do some medical experiments, a medical checkup there in the middle of nowhere in central Kazakhstan. We take a, about a two and a half hour helicopter ride back to an airfield uh, where then I got on an airplane. My Russian colleagues went back to Moscow on the airplane and I went back to Houston, three legs back to Houston. And I was landing back at home about 24 hours after uh, landing um, back on the planet in central Kazakhstan. One of the, I get questions about the, the, the human aspect of this experience often. Uh, the, the moment of landing, when the motion stops inside the capsule, every, every time, and I did it in Soyuz three times, I had this overwhelming feeling like we're home, even though it was, for me, halfway around the world in the middle of nowhere. We were back on the planet. So it's all your perspective, right, of what home is. Sometimes you, you just drive across town and you you, get, uh, you pull into your driveway or you get dropped off in the, uh, off the, you know, in the street in front of your house, you feel like I'm home. Other times you might be halfway around the world and you fly back to Singapore you land at Changi and you feel like I'm home. Well, in this case, you just land back on the planet and you have this feeling like I'm home. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, what it's like uh, to go through the experience of an expedition on board the International Space Station. The space station is the current chapter of human exploration. It's got a wonderful past already and it has a promising future. The International Partnership uh, is currently agreed to fly until 2024 as a partnership on the space station, in spite of what you might see in the news sometimes. Uh, that's the agreement that we're currently operating under, and we're all working toward extending that to 2028. And of course, over those years, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there will be continued growing opportunity uh, for commercial activities and other activities other opportunities to participate in the program. There's even talk about commercializing the space station itself, at least parts of it, if not all of it. So uh, who knows what uh, what's coming in the future. The space station, um, I believe the legacy of the space station will be multiple. There's multiple aspects of what I believe the legacy will be. One is just the achievement of the space station itself, which is very complex. The international component of the International Space Station is very significant, I think, and has provided a model, I think, which will um, uh, be replicated in future programs. Whatever we do in the future, I believe, will be done in an international uh, partnership. Of course, science and research. Uh, it will be a major component of the legacy of the space station and is growing as we speak. Uh, it is an orbiting laboratory and it gives a great opportunity for all kinds of science and research across the spectrum of different sciences when you take the, just the simple force of gravity out of an experiment and be able to isolate the phenomena that you're studying without that force. So that will certainly be a legacy, uh, part of the legacy. And also technology development. I talked about the B module. There will be other technologies that are being developed uh, and will be developed and need to be developed to support future uh, uh, chapters of human space exploration, uh, like going back to the moon to establish a semi-permanent presence and eventually on to Mars, as we hear about all the time. So that's what the legacy uh, I will believe I believe will be uh, of the International Space Station. So we have some time for, we're going to go into Q&A, or how are we doing? Okay. okay. This is the first time we've done this together. We're figuring it out. Should we sit? Yeah. Let's go.
I think a lot of the things that we've seen on the video was, uh, I think, the first time anyone has seen it because I don't think you can really find them uh, ready online as well. Right? Yeah. So, uh, so as an astronaut who has first hand experience in space, so what what do you think is the most needed innovation that we can get um, uh, to in, to increase our ability to explore space or to actually you know do more things? Yeah. In space? You're talking about for future programs, yes, in particular, uh, leaving Earth orbit, I would say the, the most critical thing that we need to do, and there are many things in the list, right? I'll just throw out one obvious one. That is uh, the continuing technology development of life support systems. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't think about, one of the critical things, if we're going to send humans into deep space, where, wherever that may be, is we need life support systems that are reliable, that we can depend on, that don't break and have to be resupplied or whatnot, that they have the performance necessary, and, and as I said, the reliability necessary. The space station is uh, very accessible. Right? We, uh, you saw three or four actually supply ships launched in that video clip that, that gave some highlights of my last stay on board. Uh, the vehicle traffic coming and going to the space station um, is very intense, and a lot of uh, what that means is that, um, or what that reflects is the access we have to the space station. When we leave Earth orbit, the access is going to go way down. When we uh, go back to the moon or the lunar system, our ability to to send spare parts to or, or repair parts um, or the things necessary to repair something that breaks is going to go down by an order of magnitude. Now think about going to Mars. Uh, we're going to have to pre-position a lot of things on Mars to support a crew on board, and they're going to have to have the reliability and the performance uh, necessary to sustain a crew for a long period of time. So that's one one answer. I mean, there are many things we could talk about, right? But that's one of the things you can tell it's important in my mind. Okay. So, yeah, so as you've seen there, we do need quite a lot of things, especially, uh, like you're saying, life support. And the further we go, um, more, the more things we need to make sure that, you know, things don't screw up along the way. So, what do you think would be the biggest, um, the biggest innovators, or where would all this innovation come from? Will mostly be still, uh, you know, uh, traditional space with uh, NASA, JAXA, ISRO, etc.? Or would it be more of um, private uh, entre enterprises doing this? Well, as you are aware, there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there doing big things in space, and a lot of them doing the less big things, the smaller things, smaller scale activities. So um, it's going to be a mix. It's going to be a mix of governments. The governments can afford to do the big things, right, as, as you mentioned. And uh, more and more, there, there will be entrepreneurs that will do um, other things that support and complement yeah. So I think that's only going to grow. That's people in this room. Right? Exactly. It's people in this room. It's, uh, you guys are the ones out there scratching your heads and trying to find out uh, how to do solve problems in new ways and things like that, or thinking up things that, uh, that the rest of us don't think about. Um, I mean, it, it has been, if you just think about what has occurred in technology just in the last few years. It's amazing, and, and you can't, it's not slowing down, right? It's only increasing. And a lot of it is, uh, most of it is entrepreneurs uh, trying something, trying to implement a new idea, and it kicks off and succeeds, and boom, it's on the way. And of course, uh, we all know, and you guys know per perhaps better than I do, that a big success comes with many attempts and, and failures along the way, and disappointments and things that don't work out. Um, so not every attempt is going to succeed, uh, but that's the business that we're in. Okay, that's true. Um, okay, so so as we see more um, private companies getting into this space, right? Uh, what, what do you think uh, it entails for you know um, uh, the equality of space? For example, right now everything is still based on uh, mostly still government based, right? Or we have satellites that are launched by private companies. Okay, but as the 
as technologies intended to be used to go into space uh, becomes privatized, how, how, how do you expect this landscape to change? Because more, more, more private companies are the ones, are the stakeholders in space. Yeah. So how do you think that will change over time? Okay, um, I can try for that one. Um, so we have had large space agencies out there doing some really critical stuff, providing the base for technology to be built upon, and I think that things will continue to be done by NASA, JAXA, ESA, and Israel, the, the big ones. But we are getting more and more into an affordable realm, so I see it as, uh, for those of you who know statistics, as a bimodal population. So you've got the big expensive experiments, and then you've got the small um, affordable ones, of which you can do many, many more because they are um, much less costly. So I think the development will continue in um, parallel, and the big difference here will be um, all of us will actually be able to afford to send stuff into space to do lots of creative things that you couldn't do if you had to wait for a billion dollars to be approved by your national government. Right. Uh, okay. Another question that I've seen. So, uh, one of the few things that we talked about was, uh, uh, like mentioned, the, the, the central team is trying to find problems uh, in space for us to solve. Right. So, what, what, how do we look for such problems? I mean, not all of us are not uh, as, uh, astronauts, right? So, and I'm sure there's a lot of you, but there's not enough for all of us to interview every day. So, how do we know um, what sort of problems there may be? If you are not uh, uh, sorry, astronauts. You mean what kind of problems that we experience uh, yeah. in executing, say, the space station program? Uh, and in how that, do you and learn also, about them? Yes, and also in terms of space exploration, uh, colonizing new worlds, uh, transporting uh, across planets. Well, the best way is to get engaged is, and keep up with it, keep up with the news. It, there's a lot of information available you can follow along the development, the future plans, the ongoing operations, the, the, the daily activities. You can follow the daily activities, what the crew is doing every day. You can uh, follow along and learn what breaks, what doesn't work right. Um, uh, and by identifying the problems, the real world problems that are out there, uh, you that might spark your thinking to maybe come up with a proposal to solve that problem or come up with a way to solve the problem and say, hey, I got the answer. So get engaged. So everything we do here on planet Earth will have to be done in space. As soon as you send humans out there for and six months is a long time, but you have people going and doing space-related industrial work, and as we move further and further away, and we need not just engineers and technicians, we need psychologists and sociologists. I mean, I'm amazed you guys live in those quarters, 5,000 square feet for six months at a time. Um, so we'll need people from all kinds of disciplines to come in, and basically anything that you do here on Earth will have to be replicated um, on some level of the space. And we already have that, really. You can go to NASA, Johnson Space Center, and, and not everybody's an engineer there. Um, we have all disciplines in the workforce. Okay, so, so that covers the problem aspect. Uh, the next aspect, of course, is uh, setting up the business. Right, so maybe this question uh, be more targeted towards Ibushi. So, um, so from what we've seen from traditional space and even a little bit in new space, um, we see that you know from the time to market to break even, SpaceX itself hasn't even break it even yet, right? So how do we how do we um, come up with a solution to this uh, extremely long um, break even point for space uh, space tech startups? Right, so that's a good question. So um, if you're doing a, a fintech app, something on your phone, you can do development and get something out there in six months, start making money in a 12 day, two months, right? But space tech, that's going to be four to seven years. And that timetable right now um, is because of a lot of reasons. One is we don't fully have off-the-shelf parts yet for everything. Um, this, this cube set that we have here, this is off-the-shelf parts. But we don't yet have off-the-shelf radiation hardening parts, but that's coming. So we'll need to have parts, and we'll also need to have um, a better process for launching. At this point, we are launching with um, a very few companies or government agencies, and again, there are startups out there that are doing launches on their own to bring the cost down. So um, I'm thinking that within the next five years, your sort of median time will go from, say, five to six years down to two or three. And in terms of return on investment, and the SpaceX hasn't made money yet, but um, they are doing some things that down the road are going to bring in millions. And, you know, asteroid mining is another good example. The government of Luxembourg, and that's a country about the size of this, they have just invested in asteroid mining. So they, they realize that this is a place where they can be a high level of return. 
Okay. Uh, so at this point, let's open up to the floor a little. Uh, do you have any questions from the audience? Right, this gentleman. Uh, so, uh, as a non-US citizen, non-citizen of any of the space agencies, uh, how do we go about working towards... So as a non-US citizen of any of the countries who have space agencies, like Japan, US, Russia, etc., how do we go about uh, working towards the goal that I have is to be an astronaut? Uh, would it be through a government agency or would it be more likely through a private agency? But currently, you're right, it's through government agencies and you have to be a citizen of the country that participates. But I think uh, uh, it will be in the very near future where commercial companies are launching their own. In fact, uh, I don't know yet, none of us know yet whether the first flight of the Boeing commercial crew vehicle, for example, or SpaceX commercial vehicle will be entirely NASA. Uh, or, or uh, government astronauts, or if it will be a mix of company and government astronauts. Uh, but certainly if it's uh, in the near future after that, after they get flying, there will be opportunities. Not only, you know, it's all the commercial opportunities that, that we anticipate uh, uh, beginning in the future. That will include people flying as crew members. So I would foresee the other opportunities through a company as an employee of that company. Thank you. Sorry, uh, this yeah, Being an uh, international crew, what kind of uh, UI, UX problems do you see? Because I saw some Cyrillic key, you know, keyboards and some English keyboards. Is there a common language you're looking at? How, how this On the space station, we use two languages, English and Russian. Uh, so that's why you saw Cyrillic on uh, uh, that's what that's how we operate on the space station. That's in, incidentally I get asked all the time what's the hardest part of the training? You know, you, you would think all that rocket science would be hard and it, it's it's actually pretty rewarding and it comes not too difficult for me, but the Russian language is the hardest part of the training. <laughs> Um, so, so actually, allow me to add on to, to the question. I think uh, he was asking also about the user interface and user experience part, right? So a lot of times uh, what we build for space is usually more functional than uh, aesthetic or, or in terms of ease of use. So do you see anything that could be improved in terms of you know, usability, ease of use? Oh yeah, absolutely. We have lots of applications. I talked a little bit about the ops line that we have. We're starting to integrate iPads on board now and, and more wireless applications. Uh, the commercial crew vehicles are, are developing um, uh, glass cockpit or even beyond glass cockpit. It's more like a touch screen technology to operate the spacecraft. Um, and a really good aerospace engineer that divides, uh, designs a, a flight control system isn't necessarily a good GUI designer, right? So we're, we're always struggling with that to make uh, the interfaces or whatever we're doing, uh, experiment or um, operate the vehicle or whatnot to be more intuitive, um, uh, to uh, to take advantage of all of those things that you're alluding to. So that's another great field of opportunity for uh, augmented reality. Yes. So, to be inside the computer. Yep. Great William, this question is uh, as regard to your uh, book, uh, which you spoke about, uh, you know, the creation and uh, the hand of God. Now, um, I'm just coming. There are two aspects of this question. The first is we see a lot of collaboration happening when it comes to International Space Commission, but when it comes to things on Earth, there's so much lack of collaboration between different nations, and so much so that we also are for war against another country. Now, uh, do, in future, do you think that ease of space travel will make this leader, I mean, take a trip uh, outside the Earth and realize what precious thing they are damaging with their policies? That is part one. And two, uh, with commercialization of uh, space technology, space mining, and all these things, we have seen what mess we have created all over the Earth through, you know, through our greed and uh, and so space mining, is there a possibility 
going on that we might do the same in space than we just have one of them? Um, those are huge questions. I, I guess. Um, the first one I'll address, it's obvious to all of us, right, that there are tensions in the world. And uh, in the context of what I just talked about uh, in the international partnership, specifically the tensions that you read about every day in, in even the last couple days uh, between the U.S. and Russia, for example. Uh, I can tell you in my experience, and I don't understand exactly why, none of us do, uh, but the last few years in particular, uh, the partnership in the entire international partnership, but it's specifically between the U.S., NASA, and Russia, the Russian Space Agency, has never been better. And uh, I've been to Russia many, many times. Uh, I've accumulated years over there uh, since the 90s. Um, and I was just there a month ago. It was my last visit there. The working relationship's never been better. And it, 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 it's a mystery to me, uh, especially when you consider the context of uh, the tensions going on right now, the geopolitics in the context of Ukraine, Crimea Peninsula, Syria, and all of that. I trust and we all hope that work on the, on the program, and that includes my, my Russian cosmonaut um, friends, uh, we all hope that we can serve as a stabilizing force to counterbalance the, the tensions, the political tensions between countries, specifically those two countries, um, and be an example to the world uh, to that effect. Uh, I can only believe that both countries intentionally have protected us and left us alone uh, in spite of what goes on. You know, there's a whole lot more to it than what meets the eye than we read in the newspaper. Typically, there's a there's sort of a public aspect and then there's a behind the scenes aspect. I don't know what's going on uh, behind the scenes, but I, I trust that uh, we are a stabilizing force and maybe intentionally. So. Um, now, my answer was a little long, so I'm trying to remember your second question. It had to do with, uh, I think it had to do with responsible utilization of space, in my words, right? And not trashing um, whatever, wherever we go out there, like we've had a history of trashing the earth, I think is what you're at. Uh, I think awareness is much higher nowadays uh, to that effect, uh, to keep those kinds of goals in mind. So uh, hopefully... Uh, we will exploit space, whether it be the lunar system, Mars, or whatever, in a responsible way in the future. Yeah, and um, also just to add to that, um, there's been an international agreement um, that was put in place last year to have anything that's launched um, deorbit within 25 years after it's, over, uh, after it's stopped functioning. So you can do that however you want, but people now have an international agreement to just not leave these things up there flying around. You've got to bring them down or eject them from the solar system. And I, uh, the space advocates, they talk a lot about, uh, you know, we have limited resources and, you know, the country, whoever sends their mission first and does mining, is it, isn't it uh, a bit of unbalanced, like, whoever goes at first gets in terms of mining and all these kind of activities, but most of the money apparently is, uh, it gets the lion's share, and then those who are coming next or the future generation, they lose out. Things of I don't know. Else. I mean, if you look at it in a little context, um, the Spaniards went to Mexico and took all the gold, right? But, you know, here we are after a while, you know, the global economy sort of, you know, leveled out. And I, I don't know how to answer that. Whoever gets there first will get it. That's just the way humans have been. That's part of what compels us to explore. But um, I actually see that as an asset, not as a reason to hold ourselves back. I, I don't have a question, but I, uh, we're all uh, sort of uh, adult entrepreneurs, right? So I want to give the chance to the future entrepreneurs, which are below 16 years old. Anybody below 16 years old want to ask a question, so that you have a chance to ask a question? <laughs> Anybody? You can ask any question, though. Kids, come on. We give you one chance only. Then the rest, the adults will take over. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay. How are you? Hi. 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 Hi.
you talked about the emotional aspect of spacewalking. And personally, as a, I just want to know what it's like and how perhaps you overcome it. Like just the emotional aspect of being in space, spacewalking or only being to get to the space um, station with one cord or something. Like how does it feel and how you overcome it and what are the emotional challenges of being a cosmonaut, etc. Yeah, it's a great question. Some people ask me, you know, I, I describe getting in the capsule as if you're triplets in the womb. And people always ask me, do you get claustrophobic? And my answer is, if you're claustrophobic, you're in the wrong business. Uh, if you have a fear of heights, you'd be in the wrong business. So a lot of those fears that a lot of people experience, you know, uh, cause folks to go do something else, right? So most of us that get into this business don't have those kinds of fears. We certainly have a lot of respect um, for the business we're in. There are risks, there are obvious risks. We're all aware of them. Uh, we have a high level of confidence in, our, in the team's ability to identify and manage those risks. But still the experience comes with a lot of emotion. You've, you know, that's obvious. Uh, most of us put on our poker face and we get in the spacesuit and we go out the door and we're doing the business, but still it's an emotional experience. But we're, you know, you're under pressure, you want to do the job. Uh, there is a lot of pressure to get the job done, uh, to get it right, but there's a lot of emotion wrapped around the obvious experience that you're going through. You mentioned the spacewalk. It's one thing to be in, in orbit and playing weightlessness and uh, look out the window and view the earth and take all that in. It's quite another thing to get outside the security of the space station um, and get in that suit and climb out and you're tethered uh, with a little steel cable um, uh, line that runs to a hook that's hooked onto a, a handrail on the outside and then crawl along the outside of that thing and then occasionally get a break and turn away and view the entire globe. It is uh, intensely emotional. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, it's beyond description, I think. But it's not fear. If, again, if, if it's fear is your emotion, you're in the wrong business. Um, and well, before that, uh, can I just ask, so what, what would you have to say to uh, aspiring entrepreneurs? Like, what motivates you? Would it help to let them know about, you know, how do you get motivated? Everybody's different, right? We're all different. Um, and I get related kinds of questions, especially from young folks. Uh, or parents of young folks that are trying to motivate them. Or, or even children. an interest in space and technology. How, how, what gets you motivated? Well, okay, what gets me motivated yeah. in terms of space? Well, I think it's obvious. It's the, What motivated me as a young person was um, science and math, trying to understand why things work the way they work, how things work. Um, so I had that instinct of exploration and discovery, I guess you could say, um, curiosity, um, and then I got exposed to aviation and I thought, wow, I want to be a pilot. And then I read a book in 1978 uh, called The Right Stuff, which is uh, the author's Tom Wolfe, and he chronicled the early test pilots after World War II and getting into the jet age and breaking the sound barrier and also the early astronauts. And I that further inspired me and then I got opportunities to get education in, in those fields. I got opportunity to go to flight school in the military and become a pilot, later to become a test pilot and eventually uh, NASA. So it was that the seeds of inspiration that, that uh, developed that passion. Sometimes, I don't know if you hear it here much, but in the States over the last 15 or 20 years, I would hear people say to young people, you can do anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to be, right? Well, we all know that's not true. <laughs> None of us can be anything we want to be. I tell young people, you know, to when they're trying to figure out what they're going to do in life, is this not yeah, working? So. Uh, when young people, when they're trying to figure out what they want to do in life, is to pay attention to yourself and find out what your interests are, where your interests lie, and those 
and then pursue those interests and feed them through education, through experience, uh, through other activities. Feed those interests, those interests will develop into passions. And then most of us have experienced a passion towards something, but those passions then will develop and continue to, to pursue those passions, continue to work hard to educate yourself, to prepare yourself, to train yourself, to get the experiences so that you're ready when the doors of opportunity open up. And that's the thing that's completely out of our control, right? We may have the interest, we may have the expertise, we may have the education, uh, but if we don't get the opportunity, we can't do it. Uh, but we want to be prepared for when those doors of opportunity open up and then if we're prepared, we can enter them. Okay, uh, unfortunately, I think we only have one last question. Uh, the lady over there? Yes. So, say good evening to all. So, I have got two questions, one for you to get in, one for you. <laughs> so, uh, I have heard about it that uh, the space station has been divided into different modules, which, uh, you know, are considered to be one, two, which I refer to one specific country. Like, for example, you're having the research happening in one module. Then it has to be patented under some country, right? Because there's an international module. So how does how does the research happen? Does it happen country-wise, or does it happen mutually altogether? Well, the space station was built with the contributions from each of the partners. So I think what you're talking about is, for example, we have a U.S. segment we call it, and a Russian segment. The Russian segment obviously was was uh, uh, supplied by the Russian partners. The, what we call the U.S. segment also includes a module that was developed and built and launched by the Japanese, the Japanese experimental module, and then the European space, uh, experimental module, also Columbus. So those were just contributions by the partners. It's not that we divided up the space station and you know, assigned it to different countries or different partners. It's that the partners made contributions to the space station. And of course, each of the partners have assets uh, contained in their uh, modules. It might be experimental facilities or, or like access or like uh, assets. Um, but. The entire partnership has the potential to use the entire, any part of the space station for utilization. Let me just add, so um, one thing, one example you might think about is, let's look at some biotech researchers at NUS who are collaborators at Caltech. So you've got a team working together to develop a new technology. So how will that intellectual property be patented? Who's going to own it? So the same methodology you use here on Earth in terms of developing resources and who's the principal investigator, you would use that in space. And rather than thinking of a laboratory here um, you know, over in Clemente or um, in Southern California, you just think of your lab as being up there. And the question is, do you feel that now that you're talking about space entrepreneurship and how you know that as of now the industry is more dominated towards government and very few private companies that are there? So uh, there are again legal agreements and aspects related to it, say so what do we know we launch? And there is a responsibility and liability added to it. So when we are doing, when, as of now, obviously the collaboration is the government and private are planning to do it together. But when you want to become a self-entity of a private company, how is the liability going to be looked after and who is going to be the responsible for it? So, okay, so first of all, there are a thousand startups out there right now doing space, and the number is growing very quickly. Um, and there's insurance. If you want to launch your payload on a rocket, um, you get insurance, and you'll get your money back, but you won't get your time back. So, there are companies out there, there are space lawyers, there are people who sell space insurance for all different parts of the mission. Um, but in terms of the legal structure, um, one thing people look at is Antarctica. So Antarctica is owned by everybody and nobody, and we have communal research facilities there. So um, there again, the model that you might use is what we use down there, just share resources, and um, just apply that to space in some fashion. Thank you so much. Okay, I think uh, we've run out of time. So one, one very last question from what I had from the audience, <laughs> all right, um, is that, so, so 
when you're starting a new startup, um, one of the things you do is you look for a problem and you, have to, uh, and you want to come up with a solution, right? So what happens after you have the solution? What sort of channels do you have that allows you to uh, receive the support that you need to start a company in space tech? Okay. So this is where I get really excited. You ask me about space or about my kids, I'll just go on and on forever. So we talked about space. Um, the thing that you can do is you can put yourself into an incubator. And what people do typically is they go into like a 12-week, a six-month program. So you learn how to do your business model, you learn how to do your fundraising, and you learn how to do some kind of product development. The issue with that is space takes a lot longer. We just talked about four to seven years. So what's actually required is a, sort of a tailored program where, yes, you learn about the business aspect, but then you also learn about space systems. Um, and today, everybody's reinventing the wheel. There's no reason that every startup has to go out there and figure out how to get a license to launch. There should be some kind of central information repository. There should be people out there who can help you get through that process faster. So we talked about off-the-shelf technology speeding things up. And we talked about launch vehicles speeding things up. Um, the other thing that can um, actually speed things up is a space technology incubator. And it happens to be that we are actually starting a space technology incubator here in Singapore. It's going to be the first one in this part of the world and the first um, active one that's going to take people literally from laptop to launch pad. We're going to accompany the startups all the way through until they get a flight qualified unit onto a launch manifest. All right, okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for the meeting. If you have any, any more questions, you can stay back after this. Uh, uh, Commander Williams will be here to sign autographs too, right? So, <laughs> all right, thank you very much. All right, everyone, thank you for coming to.